name is Tanaz Farsi, and on behalf of the Art and Art History Department, I would like to welcome all of you to this evening's lecture. It is with great pleasure and honor that I introduce Professor George Baker as this year's Davis Lecturer. The generosity of the Davis Family Art Endowment, which supports this lecture series, is an enhancement to the intellectual life of our students and was created by Gay and Judy Davis, who are both graduates of this university. The Davises couldn't be here tonight, uh, but we do thank them for the opportunity to bring leading scholars and artists to our campus every year. Professor Baker joins us from Los Angeles where he teaches modern and contemporary art history at UCLA. He arrived in Oregon last week and he has had an extremely busy week traversing Portland, Salem, and Eugene to lecture on the work of Paul Theck at our Portland program in the White Stag Building and at Willamette University in Salem, alongside meetings with artists, critics, and curators. This part of Professor Baker's visit was generously funded through the Ford Family Foundation as part of Connective Conversations, a program that intends to engage Oregon artists in a meaningful and global contemporary art conversation. We would also like to thank Kate Wagley and her staff for leading this effort. Professor Baker is a leading scholar in the field of modern and contemporary art and has been lauded as an artist art historian. Baker's work reveals the inherent collaborative nature of the research and his deep engagement with artists and art is palpable. His scholarship and criticism has been distinguished by an inquisitive consideration of the work of artists that defy easy classification. A New York and Paris based critic for Art Forum magazine throughout the 1990s, he also works as an editor of the journal October and is publishing imprint, imprint October Books. Baker received his PhD from Columbia University and is a graduate of the art history program at Yale University and the independent study program of the Whitney Museum of American Art. He has received, amongst others, an Andrew Mellon Fellowship in the Humanities, a CASVA and Whiting Foundation Fellowships, and a postdoctoral fellowship from the Getty Research Institute. Recent essays on contemporary artists include Robert Smithson, Robert Whitman, Anthony McCall, Louise Lawler, Andrea Frazier, Christian Philip Mueller, Tom Burr, Rachel Harrison, and others. Professor Baker is the author, most recently, of the artwork Caught by the Tale, Francis Picabia and Dada in Paris. Tonight, he's sharing with us recent work on Sharon Lockhart, which will be part of a short book on the work of four women artists to be entitled Lateness and Longing on the Afterlife of Photography. Please join me in welcoming George Baker. I know why you turned it off. Do this with it. So can you hear me? You, you can, good. Tanaz, thank you very much for that introduction. It's always very alienating to hear someone speak about you while you're right in front of them. They probably you normally would be saying bad things, which is why I wanted Sharon to be on the screen. I'm sure she would hate that she's on the screen. Um, but if I was going to be introduced, which I, you know, I knew I was going to be, um, I wanted her as um, imaged by another artist and uh, work by James Benning on the screen staring at you all. Um, now, I'm very, very happy to end the three lectures I've been able to, been, um, in, um, I'm very grateful to have been invited to do these three lectures, but I'm very happy to end the three lectures that I've um, come to Oregon to give. Uh, with this still very living project for me on the work of Sharon Lockhart. So the, the title of my, um, my essay tonight is borrowing from another essay I, read, I wrote, but it's not going to be that essay, uh, Photography's Expanded Field on the Work of Sharon Lockhart. Um, I'm envisioning this, as Tanaz said at the end of our introduction, as one of four essays in a very short book one of my favorite essays on the history of photography or in the, in the literature on photography is Walter Benjamin's Little History of Photography. And I'm in the, in the midst of writing what I think of as a little book on photography, four short essays, very focused work that's linked to each other. And that makes an argument for one mode in which photography may be living on in the current moment of artistic practice. 
Now, my talk has a lot of bells and whistles, and I'm not really good with whistles. Um, so I'm going to try and play you, instead of reading you an epigraph, a sound file that I want to serve as my epigraph. Coming from the project I'll be speaking to you most um, tonight by Sharon Lockhart, uh, which is a piece called Pine Flat from 2005. She works at the studio and she takes pictures and I like her too. And she is pretty and she smiles and she has a big face and she has a cute smile. Lucky. She has cute hair, and she's pretty, and I like her dress, and sh she talks, and she hugs, and she smiles. It's not my computer. I don't know what was going to come next. <laughs> I was one of the children involved in Pine Flat talking both about giving a verbal portrait, I guess, both of Sharon Lockhart to begin and of a musician and composer named Becky Allen that uh, Lockhart has worked with in many of the pieces, including this one. So about five years ago now, let me start here. I published an essay entitled Photography's Expanded Field. Now, just forgive the solipsism, because it is solipsistic, of what I'm about to do. But I want to begin by just reading a few lines from the opening of this essay to set the stakes for the specific argument I'm going to pose tonight around Lockhart's project. Um, and it was an attempt to diagnose what had happened to photography since the onset of postmodernism in the 70s and 80s. What had happened to photography in the wake of its technological outmoding by the digital and what had happened to photography in the face of the proclamation, by many at least, of its death as a coherent medium, if indeed it ever was one. So here I go. Everywhere one looks today in the world of contemporary art, the photographic object seems to be an object in crisis, or at least in severe transformation. Surely it has been a long time now since reformulating the history and theory of photography has seemed a vital intellectual necessity an art historical project that was born, rather, of the new importance of the photograph in art practices of the 1970s and the 1980s. Now, as theorized then, postmodernism could almost be described as a photographic event, as a series of artistic practices were reorganized around the parameters of photography, taken as what Rosalind Krauss has recently called a quote-unquote theoretical object. The submission of artistic objects, for example, to photography's logic of the copy, its recalcitrance to normative conceptions of authorship and style, its embeddedness within mass cultural formations, its stubborn referentiality and consequent puncturing of aesthetic autonomy. With hindsight, however, we might say now that the extraordinary efflorescence of both photographic theory and practice at the moment of the initiation of postmodernism back in those years was something like the last gasp of the medium, like the crepuscular glow at twilight or before nightfall. For the photographic object theorized then has seemingly succumbed in the last 10 to 15 years to its digital recoding. And the world of contemporary art seems rather to have moved on quite literally to a turn that perhaps now we could call cinematic, so many artists using projections as opposed to photographic logics in their work rather than photographic. So the work I've been showing you, Sherry Levine, Alan McCollum, uh, may not necessarily be always photographic, but the idea in this moment of the emergence of, say, the pictures generation with Cindy Sherman, uh, Barbara Kruger, was that the, the actual thinking of the photograph as a logic was producing pathways for some of the most um, ad advanced artistic practices of that moment. That's what I was trying to point to. But we exist in a quite different moment than that described by Rosalind Krauss 25 years ago in her essay that she called Sculpture in the Expanded Field. The elastic and what she called infinitely malleable medium categories decried by the critic then seem, in fact, today not to be our plight. Critical consensus would have it that the problem today is not that just about anything image-based can now be considered photographic, 
but rather that photography itself has in some way been foreclosed or cashiered or abandoned, outmoded technologically, but also displaced aesthetically. The artist stars, and here I'm going to get um, a little polemical, the artist stars of the present photographic firmament are precisely those figures such as Jeff Wall who reconcile photography with an older medium like history painting and what seems a very strange reversal of photography's former revenge on traditional artistic media. Or those, contrarily but also linked, such as Andreas Gursky, um, who have most fully embraced the new scale and technology of photography's digital recoding. And of course, this is hardly this Wall Gursky um, painting and digital um, opposition I put up. It's, it's hardly, in fact, an opposition of possibilities. Wall has, of course, also more and more recently embraced the digital, and Gursky is surely also a pictorialist. And even the most traditional of a younger generation of contemporary photographers cannot now seemingly ever resist the impulse to deal the concerns of other mediums into their practice, less utilizing photography to recode other practices than allowing the photograph to be recoded now in turn. As, for example, just to point to some um, specific practices, when Philip Lorca de Corsia lights his street photography with the stage lights of theater or of cinema, or Thomas Demand now accompanies his constructed photographic simulacra with equally simulated projections, placing his constructions into motion, or when an artist like Renika Dijkstra feels compelled to place video recordings of her portrait subjects alongside their photographic inscriptions. Even among them, those artists who continue in some form the practice of photography, today the medium seems what Andre Breton, the leader of the Surrealists long ago, called painting. A lamentable expedient was Breton's term. An insufficient bridge, photography that is, to other, for many artists, seemingly more compelling forms. And yet, I'm painting a doomsday scenario here, and that's not usually the mode that I'm in. And yet I'm pulled back from the finality of this judgment, from this closure of the photographic, by a strange vacillation in much of the photographic work with which I actually am going to be concerned today. In my five-year-old essay that I've been ridiculously quoting myself from as I'm starting, so I'm not actually speaking yet, I'm quoting myself. Um, in my five-year-old essay, I was concerned at first with the work of an artist I've followed for many years named Nancy Davenport. She was uh, herself like Jeff Wall, a Vancouver-based artist who now is active in New York. Um, specifically, a piece of Davenport's called Weekend Campus, where the artist concatenated into motion a series of digitally scanned photographic stills. One could also, though, think of Sharon Lockhart's dual project, as we'll see in the, in the couple minutes we have together to come, of working simultaneously within the modes of what could be called, on the one hand, cinematic photographs by Lockhart, and very still, like structural films simultaneously. How to describe such works hesitation between motion and stasis, its stubborn petrifaction in the face of progression, or its concatenation into movement of that which stands still, the dual dedication of such works seemingly to both cinema and photography at the same time. It's this hiccup of indecision, whether fusion or disruption, that I want to explore. For it seems that while the medium of photography has been thoroughly transformed today, and while the object forms of traditional photography are no longer always in evidence in much advanced artistic practice, something like a photographic effect still remains, survives, perhaps, in a new, perhaps altered form. And if we could resist the object-bound forms of critical judgment or description, as well as the announcement of a medium's sheer technological demise, we might be able to imagine critically how the photographic object has been reconstructed in contemporary artistic practice, an act of critical imagination made necessary, I think, by the forms of contemporary art, and one that will answer to neither technological explanations, purely technological reasons for the shift, nor traditional formalist criteria either, purely formal reasons for the shift. So I'm going to spare you this, but I wanted to have it on the screen for a moment. I did some mapping and emulation of Rosalind Krauss's famous essay from the 70s where she mapped the structural expansion of what she saw happening to sculpture in the wake of minimalism and post-minimalism. Um, and I tried to do something similar for what happened to the photograph at the moment of the onset of postmodernism. But it'll just sit there uh, for a moment and you can look and, and imagine what it might mean. I can't even remember, but I could remind myself. Survival, expansion, alteration, the photographic effect. 
These are the terms that interest me most in relation to the fate of photography today. Now in this essay I've been reading from Photography's Expanded Field, I did go on to map a kind of seemingly logical, although I think it's almost a parody of logic at times now, seemingly logical expansion of photography torn between stillness and motion, between what I called in this essay narrative on the one hand and stasis, between it would seem the two equally troubled domains of photography and film, or the document and the cinematic, however you want to name these seemingly um, dual but opposed pathways. Now in what follows, I want to do at least two things that the essay photography expanded field did not do. First, I'll present an extremely close reading of a specific artist's practice as it's opened up and indeed seems to be formed by a really precise interpenetration of photography and cinema, precisely what I've tried to explore in that earlier essay. In fact, I will treat in detail a project by the LA-based artist Sharon Lockhart that she called Pine Flat that came to fruition in 2005, which was the year of this essay's publication, and thus where Lockhart's work, Pine Flat, was nowhere in fact treated. But second, and more importantly from my vantage point, I offer this close reading as kind of a case study, but also as an amplification of the formal mapping of photography's expansion that my early essay hoped to, in some sense, broach. Now by amplification, I mean radicalization, um, in a way. What I hope to do here is deal not just with the forms and the possibilities opened up by the expansion of the medium of photography, but with the meaning, and perhaps to the motivations for the insistence with which many artists today place their practices between mediums, between photography and cinema, or engage in the cinematic opening of the still photograph that's been my concern. Another way of stating this radicalization would be to, to say that my concern tonight is less with the objective or kind of a structural mapping performed in that earlier essay. The interpenetration of forms, the expansion of mediums, like the photograph, has too a subjective, not just an objective logic, a desiring logic. And it's to the desiring politics of the expansion of photography that I hope my reflections tonight turn. first episode, and I use that word on, in scare quotes because it's not clear they're episodes, but in the first episode of Sharon Lockhart's recent film entitled Pine Flat, we see a pine forest blanketed by falling snow. So I'm going to show you the, what is film work, obviously, in the form of these slides. I hope if I have time, my, my talk is supposed to be about an hour. If I have time, I wanted to show you, <laughs> it's going to be an hour. I saw some despairing looks. Um, uh, if, I, if I have time, um, I wanted to show some moments from the Pine Flat film so you get a sense for what it's like when it's not still on the screen. Um, I'll explain the structure of the film. It's very structured as we go on, but we'll have to play it by ear. In this first episode, we see a pine forest blanketed by falling snow. We then hear, but do not see at all, a young girl whose plaintive cry echoes across the winter landscape. Ethan, where are you? And then she cries again. Please, Ethan, come back. Now, it seems that we are listening in this episode to a game of something like hide and seek that perhaps has gone awry. That we are listening to something we cannot see is significant, I think, for Lockhart's work and something I'll return to. But this cry of loss also strikes me as significant, given the origin of this whole project that Lockhart came to call Pine Flat. No matter Lockhart's concern with staged photographs and cinematic constructions, what we might call the old photographic strategies of what surrealists once upon a time called objective chance and the found object. Looking in the year 2000, so now over a decade ago, to get away from her home and work in Los Angeles, looking indeed for solitude, Lockhart drove some four hours north into the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains. There she came across a rural community by chance, or this is the story that has been told about the work, and she decided to stay because the space or the place struck her as what she called deeply familiar. While her previous work was known for an engagement with ethnographic representation that led to far-flung projects in her early career in places like Japan, Mexico, and Brazil, now Lockhart's attention was held by a locale that reminded her of a different sort of distance, a temporal one, as she claimed in the statement she made about Pine Flat, that the community she found was very similar to sites where she had, in fact, been raised. She didn't grow up in the West. She grew up in the East, but this was the claim she made. 
Over the course of the next four years, the artist visited and revisited the town, ultimately setting up a portrait studio in a barn in the town where she created images of the local children and collaborated with them on a film where they're portrayed in each episode of the Pine Flat film in the pristine surrounding landscape around this town. It's not clear that the town is called Pine Flat, but there is a town called Pine Flat in the Sierra Nevada um, area. It's not clear that's the town that Lockhart went to. Um, none of that is clear. And none of the origin story of the piece that I just told you necessarily is true. I'm going to take it as true, but it doesn't matter, really. Um, it's the story that's around the work right now. Unlike many artists today who prioritize obsolescent analog techniques, uh, Zoe Leonard, for example, or the filmmaker Tacita Dean, other artists that are going to be key uh, players in this project, a small book on photography I'm trying to write, the large format images in Lockhart's portrait series for this work, um, she entitled them all Pine Flat Portrait Studio, are hardly outmoded, actually, in terms of their little, literal form or medium. They're not made with old cameras. They're not done on 16 millimeter film um, in the case of these larger photographs. Instead, it's the photograph's conventions and perhaps their subject, rural youth as well, that now seem to bespeak something about the past as Lockhart engages the history and address of a specific kind of vanished non-art photographic portraiture produced often in rural locales in the late 19th and early 20th centuries by commercial photographers from August Zander in Germany. So here are some great um, uh, examples of August Zander, the Weimar photographer's work. Um, as from before Weimar, from the beginning of the 20th century through until the Nazis um, put a stop to his project. I don't know what I'm doing. Hi. Um, he embarked on a project to photograph um, a sampling, a statistical sociological sampling of the entire populace of Germany in the 20th century. Um, so these amazing portraits by Zander were somehow important, I think, to Lockhart, but also a, a man called Mike Disfarmer in the context not of Germany, although he was of German extraction, but in the United States. I expect, many of you might know August Sander's work, and I expect Mike Disfarmer is actually the lesser known of the two figures, even to an audience, if there are some photographers in the audience or photography historians in the audience. I don't know who, who you are. I hope you'll tell me later. Um, but this farmer actually is the photographer with whom Lockhart engaged most directly here in Pine Flat. While Zonder photographed his subjects always in the context of their environment, something Lockhart engages more in the film she made for Pine Flat than these photographs, this farmer, as you can see here, isolated his in an extremely Spartan studio setting with all of his subjects posed on a bare concrete floor against the same dark blank backdrop. Now, this farmer was working in rural Arkansas um, at, earlier in the 20th century, and he set up a portrait studio where he would photograph the townspeople. Um, and this was, his, this was the formula for all of his portraits that he was making. And I obviously chose portraits of children because they're related to what Lockhart was interested in, but they were portraits of all different um, age groups in the, in the, in the environment. Um, his name was not this farmer, which is something I also wanted to say before I move on. It's a, it's a taken name, a name he gave himself seemingly to disidentify like this farmer with the, with the agrarian population he actually was preserving for posterity in his images. It was as if this farmer's subjects existed in a kind of mournful void, the industrial setting and technique of the photograph emerging as the most extreme opposition to the rural Arkansas population. Now, Lockhart replicates this farmer's scenario exactly. Is this too loud? Is it too close to me? This might be the way I'm wearing it. I don't want to um, cause hearing loss. Is it okay now? Thank you. Um, this is the scenario that Lockhart replicates exactly, and she follows this farmer's reliance only on natural light and thus longer exposure times as well allowing the subjects perhaps to grow into their image, almost to bloom. Now, provoking an extreme or observing of tentativeness with an extreme focus on detail, it would seem to be in the presence of an embrace of what's been called a kind of leave-taking before the world, a kind of involuntary, almost passive, but deeply open documentary impulse that the film theorist and philosopher Kaja Silverman has recently characterized as what she wants to call the author as a receiver. For Silverman, Considering an author as a receiver is a model of what she's called authorial divestiture, 
somewhat different than what critics once called after the French critic Willem Barth, the death of the author. I'll show you another image here. Work down in relation to the late work of Jean-Luc Godard. This is obviously a Lockhart work from a different series than Pine Flat. Worked out in relation to the late film work of Jean-Luc Godard, Silverman points out that what she calls the author as receiver is seemingly always attracted to images that use natural light or focus on found objects and that relish documentary details. In this model, a kind of conceptual transvaluation of the outmoded technical support that we might think of as a kind of analog medium or an analog receiver, the artist, and this is now I'm quoting Silverman, the artist is not properly a creator, but rather a site the site where words and visual forms find, or excuse me, inscribe or install themselves. The artist or the author is a receptacle, in other words, or a surface where the world finds its inscription. A kind of authorial detachment is then key to such work, Silverman explains. We're quoting her again, where the authorial ego reigns supreme, what is negated is the place where the world should be. It's consequently only insofar as the artist succeeds in negating himself or herself as a biographical personage that he can truly be said to even be an artist, end quote. Thus Godard, and she quotes him saying this in a 1983 interview, he would say, I'm a person who likes to receive. The camera for me cannot be a rifle, since it's not an instrument that sends out, but an instrument that receives, and it receives with help receives with the aid of light. Reception has been thought of as problematic, actually, within, I'm not quoting anymore, within politics and aesthetics. We want authors, like Walter Benjamin's famous dictum, we want authors to be producers, the author as producer, not receiver, active agents, not prone to the resignation, the inactivity, or even, quoting Silverman again, the passive acceptance in the face of the given that Silverman points out are the main associations, culturally speaking, with reception in the cultural domain. And yet, the author as receiver, let's see here, I'll go back. The author as receiver is a model of transformation as well. It describes how one might conceptualize a kind of holding of oneself open to the world, which solicits our desire and potentially transforms it, but then is reciprocally transformed by it. For receiving, in this model at least, is an aesthetic labor that depends on the workings of desire and memory. The Freudian notion that, quoting Sigmund Freud, the finding of an object is always, in fact, the refinding of it, is this labor's motto. To receive is to remember. It is to be open to a new object in the world as it aligns itself with the lost objects to which we've been attached in the past. Or conversely, it's an opening where we align our desire, our past, our memories, with a new object that solicits us because of these desires of these memories in the world. The author as receiver follows the opening of desire then, not back to the implicitly maternal lost object as the Freud, Freudian or psychoanalytic story would have it, of origin, fixating upon the past. Instead, turning back moves one forward as the world responds to that desire for the lost object, the absent origin, and expands upon its demand, opening up uh, for those who will listen, entirely new pathways for desire to displace forward, entirely new what the author calls associational fields. In allowing the love once occasioned by a lost object to be displaced onto new objects in the world, to be, in a sense, libidinally recycled, libidinally reused, the fate awaiting so many of um, the obsolescent objects, perhaps like photography itself, that the author as receiver seems to track. The author as receiver ennobles that at which she gazes. To receive in this model then, or this understanding of what I'm trying to pose for Lockhart's practice, is to add value to the objects in the world. A kind of paradoxical generosity where the past comes to light up the present. Now, if this model of photography as reception, or the author as a receiver, can be applied to Lockhart's images, it must be admitted right off the bat that the photographs do present problems for such a reading in ways beyond the fact that their conventions, in fact, are appropriated from this farmer from portrait photography, to use the old postmodern term. In each photograph, the children adopt a pose. So I've been showing you one or two of these portraits now. They do not present themselves objectively or analytically at all, all in the same position. In fact, individuation from portrait to portrait seems really key to Lockhart's quote-unquote objectivist approach to photography. Hands are placed on hips. 
or stuffed into pockets. Arms are crossed defensively or hold an attribute like a drawing pad or a hunter's rifle or a lollipop. While the criticism of Pine Flat has emphasized that Lockhart entered in a, into a kind of form of collaboration with her subjects that, in fact, is now characteristic of almost all her projects, and I put this image up when I'm saying this because it's such an uncomfortable image, it seems to me, as opposed to a collaborative one. This boy always seems very uncomfortable. To, I mean, it, the, the images evoke different responses, I think, from viewers. And maybe I'll just make another aside. One thing my images on the screen will not be able to produce for you, when you see these photographs in person, they're under glass, and the glass is very reflective. And so any encounter with the photographs involves also you, you're seeing your own reflection in that glass. It's inevitable. It's been the most shocking thing about seeing the photographs when I've been able to see them in person, which you can't get at all in these digital images. Um, so entering into a form of collaboration is what I was saying with her subjects. It's now characteristic of almost all her projects, which for the most part seem always to want to revise problematic conventions of human portraiture. We cannot be sure of the origins of the pose in photograph after photograph, whether it comes from the artist or from the subject. The attributes may also have been the children's idea or potentially provided for them by the author. We face a similar undecidability with regard to costume, which ranges here from everyday jeans and t-shirts to what you're looking at here, I guess, elaborate biker outfits, um, and combinations even more outlandish and the general tendency, I think I can say this, of children to mix and match clashing pieces of clothing. Witness a young girl seemingly buried beneath her accoutrements, which include a catcher's mask, cowboy boots, fringed turquoise riding chaps, a hunter's vest, and an outside plaid flannel shirt marked with the word Wrangler, a cowboy nostalgia brand, brand that I guess is still around, but was de definitely very popular with American children. In the, in the 60s and 70s, at least when I was growing up. Do you still wear a Wrangler? No? You wear a Wrangler? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, now, I've given this talk once or twice before, and I've been told that, the, that um, um, Sierra is obviously dressed for some kind of a rodeo on the right, and I know nothing about rodeos. So I don't know if that reading seems plausible to you, but I, I just thought it was incredible that she wore Okay. Okay. Well, still, children. <laughs> children. You know, art historians don't care about the facts. Uh, <laughs> still, she's dressed outlandishly. It's entirely unclear, in other words, whether the photographs are to be understood as fictions or documents, whether they engage in a kind of performative acting by the children or testify to a kind of really unselfconscious being in the moment there before the camera whether they approximate this farmer's models from the past, from history, appropriate them, use them, copy them, or whether they locate an untouched pocket of rural existence in our present. And actually, also, Lockhart's film presents us with a similar set of problems. Oh, hello. Working in 16 millimeter, Lockhart's medium in this instance now, as opposed to the photographs, is deeply obsolescent. However, here too is a paradox. Pine Flat connects its outmoded analog form, the 16 millimeter film, to the pristine object or subject of youth and nature, however potentially threatened in our post-industrial, supposedly post-industrial present. The form is almost classical, so I'll describe the film to you. We'll maybe get a chance to see some of it before our, our time is up. Lockhart films episodes that are all 10 minutes in length. Six in the first part of the film, of individual children in the rural landscape, and then six more episodes of children gathered together into groups. So the film builds from isolated children to children in some kind of communication with each other or in groups. The 10 minute expanse of each episode corresponds, more or less, to the full length of a single reel of 16 millimeter film. During the time in which the film is allowed to roll to its depletion without interruption or any cuts, Lockhart's camera remains absolutely still. It's also insistently frontal or objective. Um, frontal or objective, quote unquote. In this, the camera's fixed and passive gaze seems to register the non-heroic, non-narrative activities of the individual children, as in the individual episodes they perform simple tasks, like reading a book in a field, 
sleeping near some mountain rocks, listening to the forest sounds while hunting, or waiting before a verdant valley for a slowly approaching school bus throughout the full 10 minute duration of the scene. All of the quote unquote open, passive attributes of the author as receiver seem to be in effect. And yet, while Lockhart supposedly scouted her pristine locations with the children, this is the episode sleeper, if you can guess, um, and perhaps discussed with all of them what activities they might enjoy based on their own proclivities. She's, she's spoken about how she did collaborate with the children to a certain extent and found the locations and asked them what they wanted to do there. We again are not faced with a film of found documentary footage, even though this is its address. All of the episodes were staged for the camera. It's as if Lockhart does not recognize the opposition between fiction and documentary at all. Now, actually, such has been the ambivalence of Lockhart's images from the very beginning of her career. This is the episode Hunter, the still from that episode. The vast majority of her earlier portrait projects were actually focused on children or young adults. So this has been consistent, and it remains consistent in Lockhart's work. Not all of the work is about children, but vast amounts of the projects, the majority of the projects are. She just had a show in Los Angeles at her gallery, Blanc & Poe, where she showed a film made in Poland called Pod Gorka, um, which is all about, is, is all concerned with films that she made in a specific neighborhood of Warsaw um, of children playing games, like Bruegel, the different kinds of games they would invent, and she would film them for a specific amount of time in each episode, like the Planes Black Project. It was, it was a, very, a, a film very connected to Planes Black. Um, and as another aside, if any of you can get down to San Francisco, um, as I'm giving you this Lockhart talk, there is a major Lockhart exhibition at SF MoMA that's up now and for some time. Uh, based around her more recent body of work that if I have time again, I'll try to get to a little bit at the end of my talk called Lunch Break about uh, workers in the state of Maine where Lockhart's from. So I was ending with this ambivalence that she doesn't seem to recognize the opposition between fiction and documentary and that that's been the address and the ambivalence of all her images from the very beginning of her career as an artist. The vast majority of her earlier portrait projects were focused on children or young adults. In her audition series from 1994, Lockhart photographed children locked in what seemingly awkward but deeply in touching embrace, as if she were trying to capture the non-replicable moment of one's first kiss. However, Lockhart produced five of these photographs, each with different children, but in the same locale, except for the fact you may notice, if you look closely, the five photographs that Max shows up twice. Lucky Max is what I always think. Maybe he was a Lothario. But his two images are so different, right? Um, OK, so there's five of them. Max comes twice. First kiss. It's impossible um, then to read them as documentary of photojournalism. They're obviously hardly examples of what Cartier-Bresson called the decisive moment in photography. Lockhart's images actually, in this case, quite obviously when you come to look at the project and hear about the project more directly, in this case, um, instead deployed Hollywood or theatrical, theatrical conventions of the audition, which she prioritized in each of her titles. Um, and each image actually was the result of the children's attempt to replicate a prior image. Reminiscent in this way of what I've just described is the very logic of the author as receiver, to bring back to life a memory image, an image from the past, to replicate, to bring oneself into alignment with another image. In this case, in fact, it was uh, from a film source, the climactic first kiss scene from one of Francois Truffaut's films about children, from a series of films he did about children that have been very significant to Lockhart, called in French, L'Agent de Poche, or Small Change, is the way this 1976 film is often um, so I want to switch to a DVD, and I am not the master of the machine. So I thought I'd show you a few seconds from the climax. I'm going to, if you've never seen Small Change, I recommend the film to you, but I'm going to, spoil alert, show you the, show you the end. Are you okay with that? Uh, we can start it, yeah. It's a really, really beautiful film if you haven't seen it.
probably show you about five minutes of the film. So sit back and relax. Sound on, yeah. Mon cher cousin, ça y est, c'est arrivé. Dans le train qui nous emmenait à la colonie de vacances, je l'ai tout de suite remarqué. J'ai bien vu qu'il m'avait remarqué aussi. Il s'appelle Patrick. Hier, on nous a emmenés au stade pour assister à une course de vélo derrière moto. Inutile de te dire que je n'ai pas beaucoup regardé la course. Une en plus. Aujourd'hui à midi, nous étions au réfectoire et soudain j'ai été prise d'un besoin pressant. Tu peux me garder ma pomme Tu me la manges pas, hein Je reviens dans cinq minutes, je vais faire pipi. Hé, hey, j'ai envie de faire une blague à Patrick. Alors, en rentrant au réfectoire, 
Okay, so is my mic on again? Yeah. Um, I mean, you can see in the in the reenactment that she's done at least one thing very striking, and she's reversed the the, the perspective of the shot. Um, if you just remember back a moment, it was shot from the other side in the film, but otherwise, this is the scenario of the setup. So, in this replication or reenactment, the photographs in Lockhart's audition series thus presented a set of memories, quote unquote memories might characterize using the term falsifying. We might even say, maybe it's a better term, exteriorizing. A, a, a falsified memory, an exteriorized memory. Memories that don't belong to us, quote unquote, but at least in part belong to the world. Lockhart's, oh, hello. <laughs> I forgot I put that there. Lockhart's photographs for the later project she made that she entitled Gosha Gaoka um, followed a similar logic. This is from 1997. You see a series of individual or group portraits of Japanese girls, members of the same high school team, and there was a film, and then a series of photographs here as well. I was just showing you a still from the film. Um, members of the same basketball team seemingly captured while the team was playing or practicing. However, Lockhart's images were arrived at only after the girls chose favorite sports photographs of basketball stars, in fact, sometimes American basketball stars, but not only, upon which to model their actions and their poses. And there's one example of a source. And again, she, you see she's reversed the shot, like she did with the Truffaut film. Whatever we can make of that, I actually don't know what I make of it yet. Lockhart's photographs thus dismantle many of the assumptions, both of art portraiture and ethnographic documentary or documentation, the two discursive formations to which her work seemed oriented. Modeling pose and costume upon prior images was not her only strategy. As in Pine Flat, the settings in which the act of portraiture occurs became an overriding concern, the photograph's world, in other words. This was enacted most poignantly in her Brazil projects that led up to a film she called Teatro Amazonas in 1999. Following anthropologists on research trips in the Amazon basin, Lockhart produced a series of photographic images that moved laterally away from, the direct, from direct portraits of the ethnographic subjects of the field research these um, ethnographers were involved in. Not these images, but actually I'm thinking of these coming up. Um, in a series called Interview Locations, she photographed the homes in which the um, subjects had been interviewed, but absent of their inhabitants. Simultaneously, she requested tr um, treasured snapshots from these same families, which she then simply re-photographed for a series she called Family Photographs. The result was a first series that gathered to itself so many images of seemingly abandoned homes emptied out domestic space, and another that spoke of time past in an anonymous voice, like rootless or discarded memories bereft of their original owners. Nostalgia obviously whispered through both of these two projects. Inasmuch as the abandoned domestic interiors appeared like old black and white photographs of the kind Walker Evans had once produced for his well-known project with James Agee, let us now praise famous men. Um, and the re-photographs but uh, family snapshots also attach themselves to older imaging technologies and bygone times. But nostalgia attached itself even more deeply, I think, to those early works by Lockhart where her focus on youth portraits and on domestic interiors actually came together and were fused into the very same image. Um, I want to say this, of course, because nostalgia, just as an aside, the very etymology of the term nostalgia, if you're familiar with it, it means the ache to return home this kind of ache to return to the past. It comes from the two words in Greek of nostos, home, and alja, or pain. So the pain to return home is what nostalgia literally, in the most literal sense of the term, is what I'm trying to, in fact, begin to point to here. All without titles, these images by Lockhart, these now single photographic images were filled with a general sense of languor and of suspension. 
a photograph of a young girl napping on or near a glass table, enveloped by its mirror embrace. A young woman in an old fading home turned away from the camera. Rather than snapshots or documents whose content they seemed to imitate, these images were elaborately staged, with locations scouted, costumes chosen, and lighting arranged again along what has to be called a kind of cinematic model. They were, in other words, I guess we, sh we should begin to be more precise about how we describe our projects like this. They were, in other words, directed photographs, like we speak of the direction or the director of a film. Um, and although she's actually often spoken about as a photographer, and indeed she was trained at first in a technical photography program or school, and definitely does have photographic skills, this has been actually Lockhart's model for the production of her photographic series in her work since its earliest moments. So photo historians always seem to miss the fact that Sharon Lockhart does not take her own photographs. They talk of her as a photographer. Sometimes I find myself doing that. Maybe sometimes she has done, but you can more uh, accurately describe these works as staged and directed photographs where she uses a camera person like a film director uses a DP, a director of photography. They're not taken by her. So photo history is having some problems with Sharon Lockhart that I've um, engaged when I've gone to things like conferences and roundtable discussions on photography. And then when you tell photography historians that, they have no interest in her work anymore. So, so we'll see about that. Um, similar images of children were made simultaneously in natural settings. Looking forward, I think, in this way to Pine Flat. But the peculiarity of almost all of these latter photographs, like this dip diptych Julia Thomas I'm showing you now from 94, or other untitled images from a few years later, 1996, and perhaps attributing to their enigma and suspended sense of time, was how in each image she made, the subject did not look forward, but turned away, or turned back, to look along with the viewer into the black or fog and shouted, not frog and shouted, distance of the photograph. Now, it's slowly become apparent that these early portraits take an opposite but linked approach to that evinced in a series like Audition. Where if the latter photographs, the Audition photographs, had approximated snapshots that had been modeled upon a specific cinematic source, here Lockhart's cinematic portraits held a kind of mysterious dialogue with prior documentary images, prior documents, actually in this case family snapshots. Beginning in 1994, Lockhart had already adopted the strategy enacted later in her Brazil piece for the family photograph series, engaging in a kind of what I guess has to be called self-ethnography, as she began first, before going to Brazil, to re-photograph her own personal archive of her family's photo albums. The series continues to the present day. Lockhart calls each of these images an untitled study, re-photographed snapshot. In many of the studies, quote unquote studies, we see Lockhart as a child in the arms of her father, or holding hands with her mother or her sister, almost always turned away from the camera. So it seems like Lockhart seemed just to pick those family snapshots that were something like the failed snapshots, the ones that didn't give you the information the family picture is supposed to give, the one where your back was to the camera, where it was out of focus, or et cetera, et cetera, in ways that we'll see. Hardly any critical accounts have noticed or even remarked upon these images. The artist has never spoken of them, but she's allowed them to be reproduced in various publications without any comment. One exception would be an early essay by one of Lockhart's teachers and a good critic in terms of writing about LAR surely in the 1990s by Timothy Martin, who comments on their relation to the untitled photographs of 1994 to 96. So I'm quoting Martin here. He's one of the only critics, the only critic before I got interested in, these, in this series who actually ever really said anything about them. Lockhart's pictorial language was now beginning to take the role of characterization upon itself, employing a cinematic sense of mise-en-scene as its chief device, though making no further overt reference to specific films. Nearly all of the untitled large-scale color photographs of 1994 to 96 pursue this pictorial language to greater and greater degrees of scenic involution and mystery. And in nearly all of them, the human subject is obliquely posed, many with their back to the camera, a figure then of vacancy, stillness, and deferral within a picture of tense visual expectation. Curiously, a few of these poses um, a few of these poses echo those seen in the artist's rephotographed family snapshots, which he's produced from 1996, that's a mistake, um, it was earlier, to the present day. In these nostalgic images, she, her sister, her mother, and father appear as solitary or paired figures, typically with backs to camera, before natural vistas or more domestic placid scenery. 
A sense of longing and deferral in these images offers a powerful, though muted, personal counterpoint to the cinematic grandness of the large-scale photographs, which appear to derive from them in ways that remain essentially indeterminate and perhaps private. That's the end of the Timothy Martin quote. The untitled study series do not exactly amount then to a set of image sources, like art historians look for sources. Instead, they're held in a lesser or greater dialogue with Lockhart's cinematic portraits, a strangely distanced relation to images of one's personal history, coming into contact with a distanced, staged image of intimacy in the present. If you could follow that chiasmus. That's, I think, a good description of the weirdness of how these works sit next to the works, the large-scale photographs you began to make. And this dialogue, I would say, continues into the present. As the natural scenery and poses uh, of the re-photographed family snapshots find a startling series of echoes in the current images from Pine Flat. Indeed, now Lockhart has re-photographed a series of commercial portrait photographs of herself and her sister. So that's Sharon um, on the left when she was a child re-photographed as an untitled study, um, documenting some kind of historical survival of the portrait practice once engaged in by photographers like this farmer into her own personal history, her own life, and I guess many of ours as well, um, which uh, then continues into the present, and which she then extends to the children also of Pine Flat. And many of Pine Flat's film scenarios seem to follow closely from Lockhart's enigmatic family images with pairs and trios of children playing in both the untitled studies and the episodes she constructs in the film, um, with both snapshots of herself or her family members with back to camera taken up in episodes seemingly of Pine Flat, like uh, Sleeper, as you see here, or Bus, as you see on the left there, where the child is waiting for the bus for the full 10 minutes of the uh, episode in Pine Flat, seemingly also coming right out of the family snapshots in some way or another one called Snowy Hill. It's as if an initial analogy first occurred to the artist around the issue of pose, the fact that these enigmatic, maybe failed snapshots of family members seen from behind created a correspondence with the situation of the viewer's orientation toward the image, with both viewer and photograph subject gazing toward a distant horizon, like the unfathomable vista of the enigma of the past itself. Both viewer and viewed, whoa, were positioned Sorry. Both viewer and viewed were positioned similarly in relation to that unknown scene and to a kind of thus infinitely deferred desire. And then it's as if this initial analogy inspired Lockhart to seek out another series of affinities, a tuning, I want to say, for earlier cinematic photographs or the current images from the Pine Flat Project to these erratic images from her own past. So just to clarify, if it's not clear without captions on the screen, I'm showing you one of the episodes from Pine Flat on the right, the episode Bus, and one of Lockhart's re-photographed family snapshots, in this case of herself, on the left. I just use this word, though, attunement, or attuning. Attunement, I want to claim, has become Lockhart's overriding artistic concern. Attunement. Now, I realize this may be a strange word, though maybe not in Eugene. It is used mostly, to my knowledge at least, in New Age discourses uh, or non-Western practices like Reiki. I've looked this up. For example, I'm showing you a screenshot from www.attunement.org. Now really, I want nothing to do, I'm sorry, Eugene, with these understandings of the word, or at least I think I do not. What I've been attracted to instead is the word's musical origins, in harmony and tuning, of course, Something of a great attraction for me in the face of an artist who actually began her work with a series that she called Auditions, or The Audition, a title taken by critics for its theatrical or performative meaning mostly, but which must be considered an oral, A-U-R-A-L, or oral, not oral, um, or sound terms as well, surely, or so I want to argue. For example, nothing could be further from Lockhart's Audition series than the Andy Warhol model of the screen test a title she could have but pointedly did not use for many of her photographic images. But sound and silence, images of musical instruments and scenes, a counterpoint to the artist's attentiveness to the deep silence of the photograph as an object, these have seemed key, in fact, to Lockhart, and by now for quite a long time. So I'm showing you one of the single image works she's made on the right where she's photographing two blind children reading. 
alongside the auditions series as well. So okay, attun attunement. It's a metaphor or device that functions in Lockhart's work like similar devices, I think, in artists who seem quite close to her. So I just want to open a window onto my larger book project. For example, we could point to Zoe Leonard, the artist Zoe Leonard's massive archival project that she's entitled simply Analog. Um, where the photograph is considered everywhere in relationship to an analog receiver, or more to the point, is conceived as a kind of literal receptacle in work after work, a container waiting to be filled from early works, not in the analog series like these photographs she made of birds' nests with their waiting eggs snuggled within them, to her early sculptures, which were using the skins of skinned fruits and reconstituting them, sewing them back together, Receptacles, holders are everywhere. In more recent sculptures where she's used found flea market suitcases to make portraits and sculptures, portraits she often thinks of members of her own family. Or to the analog series itself where you see in her urban photographs of the kind of fading New York world that the, that the series starts with at least, image after image after image of receptacles, objects that hold other objects, objects holding other objects in their grasp, bags, sacks, those tin things in the deli counters, food holders, wheelbarrows holding a television, reflecting the camera, shoes and flea markets. For the author as a receiver, the photograph as receptacle, this may seem like, in a sense, an essentialist metaphor, photographic essentialism or feminist essentialism or both. And one wants to wonder about the connections between the two. But its use as a device is too persistent everywhere we look in Leonard's project, I think, simply to be ignored or glossed over. We could also point to the British artist Tassin and Dean's films and their metaphorical play with what I have discussed in work I've been uh, writing about her as the similarly oral, meaning sound structure, of the echo. Rhyming objects and mediums, so a typical work for Lockhart, excuse me, um, for Tassin and Dean earlier in her career was to seek out an object and to film it in 16 millimeter or 35 millimeter. And the object and the film were both in some sense fading objects, historical objects, obsolescent objects, or objects seemingly attracted to each other for reasons somewhat um, dissimulated or not really spoken directly to. Uh, rhyming objects and mediums, the echo, beings and architectures, as in her 2003 film uh, entitled Boots, which I'm just showing you some stills here on the screen. You could also point to other artists like Moira Davey and her similar, in fact, programmatic understanding of the photograph as both receiver and as receptacle. In images of receivers and record players and analog sound production, but also in photographs she makes of things like her family refrigerator as a site of inscription for holding of messages and images and other things. More oral than visual, here's some more Maura Davy. And Lockhart images, I'm going to skip these for now. But these are from the more recent series, uh, posterior to Pine Flat, uh, a series of works she's entitled, uh, the whole group, Lunch Break, where she's been photographing a series of receptacles again, in this case, um, you know, lunch containers of the, uh, as, as an idea for a way to make a portraiture of the workers in a specific factory in Maine that she was making this project around. More oral than visual, Lockhart's strategies of attunement expand the literal obsolescence of the analog into what we might call a conceptual strategy of analogy. To attune something requires two forms. It can never be a solitary endeavor. Attunement is the attempt to bring forms close, to have them rhyme. It's a word we could use to understand Lockhart's insistent linkage of terms we normally perceive as oppositions, rhyming in her work, document and fiction, past and present, viewer and viewed, subject and object, self and other, until the opposition, this is what I want to stress, the opposition will no longer hold. Attunement is a desiring and a kind of emotive mode. It's the form of Lockhart's disorienting version of receiving, the way in which even while intensely manipulating her images, she makes space for the world outside. It's an action modeled on the workings of memory itself, the affinities through which desire can be displaced from past to present, I think, and vice versa. It's a device through which we might finally begin to understand that commonplace of the criticism directed at Lockhart's work that sees it as a kind of uncanny combination of both distance and affect, of objective photography 
or film techniques like structural film and the emotions. A combination that, moreover, of course, you probably already noticed, Lockhart seems to signal or underline precisely in the connotations of her project's title, Pine Flat. Of course, pine is to emote, nostalgically waste away for the past, and flat would seem to be the opposite of that. So the title, I think, is very significant. I've been talking a lot to artists lately about titles, and this one, I think, um, is very precise in the way it wants to operate. Her attunement, Lockhart has shown, can come from strangely ready-made conventions and unlikely, perhaps alienating places. It can emerge from practices of mass culture for Lockhart, it seems. Hollywood, for example. Witness her photograph of one of my favorite actors, um, Ben Gazzara, Los Angeles, California, March 21st, 1998 is the full title. Photographed in close-up, gazing almost longingly into the camera, head resting on his hands and on a pillow while he lies in bed. Evidently, the photograph of the aging actor was taken on a film set, for Lockhart has paired it with a second image of a young woman in exactly the same pose. This is actually Gazzara's stand-in during shooting, as Lockhart's title um, informs us. The result is immensely confusing, and yet intensely erratic. It's as if this commonplace cinematic practice during filming has produced a document of two individuals now deeply aligned, exchanging places with each other, attuned from one to the other. I'm obviously overreading, but I think I have the work behind me to back this up, so stay with me, if you will. Possible scenarios proceed from this uncanny att attunement, narratives having nothing to do with the story that we assume is being filled, so let me overread some more. Perhaps we are facing an amorous situation, a document of a couple in the intimate space of their bed. Or perhaps we face a memory, like those where we recognize an intensely personal attachment to a parent, but we can't remember if we're thinking of an image of our father or our mother, interchanging them within our minds. Or it's as if we see a scene of deep but loving identification, is another possibility, where a daughter, quote unquote, takes the place and the position of her father. All these scenarios seem potentially legitimated by the images, but none of them, of course, are definitive. And we hardly need to stop there. For the situation only becomes more expansive when we realize that these two photographs are themselves attuned to earlier images within Lockhart's oeuvre. By pose with the untitled 1996 portrait of the sleeping girl near the glass table, for example, or by gaze with Lockhart's diptych of two teenagers standing before the sea, staring into the camera as if they were reaching toward each other as much as toward the viewer across the gap in both space and time, Lily and Joachim of 1994. And since all of these images may or may not be photographs aligned with Lockhart's own memory images, the attunement, potentially at least, becomes more disorienting still. In addition to alienating ready-made conventions, attunement can also emerge from dissonance for Lockhart itself. Lockhart's tactics seem dependent on such oppositions and on the redemption implicit in trying, at least, to overcome them. Such was the task, I think, of Lockhart's film, Teatro Amazonas, where in this film she filmed from the point of view of the stage, an audience in Brazil gathered to listen to an atonal composition by Lockhart's frequent collaborator, another collaborator I want to underline, this time a musician, Becky Allen. First, the project aligned the atonal composition that Allen produced with the community portrayed before us. A choral work for many voices, attuned to a group of many faces, gathered by Lockhart according to seemingly like atonal music, alienating or inorganic procedures derived in this case from sociolo sociological procedures, a kind of sampling, a scientific sampling of the entire population of the Brazilian city of Manaus, where this um, opera house stands. And as the burst of vocal music began over the course of this film to diminish, voice after voice eventually dropping out, that was the, the piece's progression, voice after vo voice stopping until in the end, less and less voices, less and less voices are carrying their notes. The dying of the music allowed the ambient sound of the community before the camera to emerge, back to be born. And so multiple dissonances come into alignment here, climaxing what we might consider a kind of foundational series for the artist, the attunement of the viewer and the viewed, of self and other, and of history and the present, as an audience in the past faces and models an audience gazing at the film at each moment of its present or future screening. So this is a kind of emblematic work, Teatro Amazonas, I think, for Lockhart. 
is a film form not just, of course, of receiving, an audience literally listening to music, receiving an aesthetic form, but of a kind of inescapable attunement between these two entities and a kind of individuation. But also, it's an audience on film that's being stared at by an audience like yourselves in space. And so it produces another kind of scenario, potentially, of two things that are alike but are not the same. And maybe another word, like attunement, has to come into play to describe what that relationship could be said to be. Now, music was included, actually, in Pine Flat as well, in the intermission. We're in intermission linking the two six-part halves of the film. So there was 60 minutes, and then an intermission, and then 60 minutes. It's a two-hour film. Um, when it's shown in the theater, I could talk about the format a little bit more after. Was filled with the sound of a young boy playing guitar and singing along to a prior model, trying to copy, in this case, creating his own rather tentative, it must be said, version of the angst-ridden pop-punk anthem Stay Together for the Kids by the California band Blink-182. Does anybody know that song? It's horrible, right? <laughs> and the kids' version of it is, is amazing. I won't play it for you. I won't put you through it. But that was the intermission. Actually, at the same moment as the making of the Pine Flat Project, there's the kid. Uh, making his um, his uh, sound recording. But I'm talking about the photograph on the right now. Uh, Lockhart made one of her most musical single image photographs, a staged or directed image entitled simply Untitled Herod, 2005. It's a photograph of work or labor related to her prior images of repair work in a Mexican museum or conservation or installation work in museums as well. Lockhart's series of photographs related to Morris Lewis paintings or Dwayne Hansen sculptures to which I'll return. Uh, Lockhart simply described the impulses of this work, though. Perhaps her most tacit dean like photograph or project outside of the purview of her own analog or 16 millimeter film work. I'm just going to read you Lockhart's words because she did write a description of this piece. With Herod, that's the cello repair guy's name, I wanted to do a work about conservation to go along with my Dwayne Hansen and Morris Lewis photographs, which are about conservation of art. I'll come back to them. I had heard about a Stradivarius cello that had been left on a front porch in Los Angeles and was stolen. <laughs> it turned up four days later in a dumpster and was sent to a local conservationist named Robert Cower for repair. We visited his studio to approach him about photographing a cello being restored. The Strad had been finished for months, but he showed us around and we saw the entire process. His studio was surprisingly small and was located in a converted bungalow in Hollywood. He had a shipping container in the driveway packed with choice pieces of the appropriate wood. Several apprentices worked on instruments as we were shown around. The process was fascinating, and the stories of the workers were equally so. None of them were musicians or carpenters by trade. They had all happened into the job and trained in the specific craft of instrument repair. According to Mr. Cower, it requires just the right combination of ear and carpentry skills. Finding musicians to train as carpenters or carpenters to train as musicians never worked out. They were like a family, all working there for years. Herod had come from the Bahamas and worked for the shop for 18 years. Herod worked on a cello, preparing the neck for the photo. I liked the way the instrument was held upside down as he filed the neck, going against the typical playing position. I also liked the very personal and domestic setting, in opposition to the institutional setting of my Hansen photographs. The afternoon light coming through the door of the studio reminded me of a 17th century Dutch painting and it seemed appropriate considering that the basic craft techniques haven't changed since that time. No one, of course, has improved on Stradivarius's design. So I'll just let Lockhart's description stand for the moment with this image. With the photographs pointing to analogies, obvious pointing to analogies between music and photography, between restoration and photography, I think, between history and the present, between detritus and repair and care, and return to how all these metaphors get worked out in the Pine Flat Project. I'm coming up on my hour, aren't I? Just trying to get there. Yeah, okay. I am getting there. I've got a long version of this talk, which I won't do for you. <laughs> um, in the musical intermission recorded for Pine Flat, we listen to the boy as he diverges from the original song and even changes key, breaking his voice from time to time. With this, Lockhart signals the processes of attunement that in fact run through the whole of the Pine Flat Project. For here, it's the staged manipulated image that registers the model of the author as receiver, I think, producing a kind of uncanny rhyming of past and present, a melancholic looking back to a kind of time of origins or of the lost object, we might say, that paradoxically locates a model of a new beauty in the world today, a 
new value in the present time. Indeed, aside from considerations of artificial costume and pose or potential models and image banks from other places, people, and times, the photographs in the Pine Flat Portrait Studio series manifest one manipulation more directly than any other. Each of the images are absolutely attuned to all the rest. What do I mean by that? By precisely altering, you can see it very clearly here, the distance of her camera to the children based on their relative sizes, Lockhart was able to photograph each child at the very same scale within the frame. The oldest and tallest of the children occupies the very same space within the image as the youngest and the smallest. The children thus all appear literally to rhyme as they are brought into physical correspondence with each other. The tactic seems egalitarian, but it's also deeply de-individuating, potentially alienating, diffusing the series' reliance on photographic objectivity and the portrait genre's role in the construction of identity. Now, this is something Lockhart's done before as a strategy. Uh, for example, in her film work that was in the Whitney Biennial some years ago, entitled No, where haystacks are positioned at different distances from the camera, um, were built at different scales in that distance to look all the same size, like a kind of minimalist grid or minimalist sculpture in the, final, in the scenes in the final film, equalized within the image, at least, if not actually in reality or in the world. Arranged in a set diegetic line, and mostly organized when displayed uh, from younger to older children, let me just go back here, the portrait series attunement of all of its images works against this chronological ordering device as well. For we seem to perceive the slowing of the linear march of time or witness it halted in its tracks altogether. Photographs of sisters, perhaps taken at the same time, seem like potential images of the same person taken at two different ages. Photographs of the same child, taken at two different moments during the project's life, become impossible to reconcile, as if aging bifurcated the child into two different subjects, or conversely was held in abeyance, as physical signs such as growth all but canceled out. The project of Pine Flat took Lockhart five years to complete. In this, the portrait series finds itself beset by wayward analogies, unruly photographic correspondences and affinities, and begins to produce forms of what we might imagine as the kind of falsifying movements more characteristic within the time uh, play of things like the medium of avant-garde cinema. The photographs, in other words, thus seem to attune themselves to something like the medium of film. Conversely, the Pine Flat film attunes itself to photography, and this is one scene that uses sound very directly of this boy for the full 10 minutes playing uh, really annoyingly on his harmonica out in nature. Each image within it remains largely static. Cinematic movement lies suspended. The film seems to slow, to become, like a photograph, almost still. In this, the photographic attunement of film appears like a turning back of Lockhart's medium on itself, a return of cinema to its photographic prehistory. And in this turn backward, the film begins to attune itself to its subject, to the look back at the rural and at youth, to the activities and temporality of childhood a slowed image positioned by a tomb and squarely between photography and film, opens itself to the in-between suspended activities of the child, reading a book with rapt attention, napping quietly, waiting distractedly, playing on swings, moving languorously back and forth, treading water in a country stream. Let me go back here. Now, critics have remarked that all of these activities and many of Lockhart's untitled photographs that led up to the 2005 film seem reminiscent of the unselfconscious attentiveness often depicted in pre-modernist painting, um, like in paintings like the painter Chardin, for example, um, where a depicted subject seems to block out the surrounding world. And for the art historians in the crowd, you now know I'm starting to edge onto the territory of the art historian, the crucial art historian, modernist art historian, Michael Fried, um, that Michael Fried has called in these subjects like this, absorption. Moving from these absorptive activities to the peculiarity of Lockhart's mise-en-scene in the film, which seems to drain each episode of any sense of a contrast between figure and ground, as she uses color matching to seemingly, um, in a sense, rid the images of any sense of depth, feel, depth within the image. Um, the point has been made that Lockhart wishes to engage not only with the history of painting, but specifically with modernist painting, which was trying to get away with that sense of perspectival depth and figure ground and with its self-reflexive and ultimately, in a certain sense, medium-specific, solipsistic project. Now, I want to deny that this is the case. But perhaps I'm in denial. What about, you might ask, the Morris Lewis images that Lockhart has recently made? 
Here indeed is photography contemplating modernist painting, actually directly. More, Michael Fried as an art critic's modernist painting. For Morris Lewis is one of the artists that Michael Fried most directly supported in his early life as an art critic before he gave up writing about contemporary artists until the present, when he's returned to us now with his book about Douglas Gordon and Henri Sala and the like. We can talk about that later. Um, indeed, the Morris Lewis images, actually, I want to say are crucial. For me, they become something more than staged photographs. Lockhart's um, interest in absorbed subjects involved in their labor. They are not just staged. They're literally actually about staging. They are about replication. What we're witnessing here, in fact, in the, in the Morris Lewis series, is the redoing of the supposedly inimitable Lewis work by a conservator. The redoing of its presentness, quote unquote, as Fried would have called it, with a double by an art conservator. In fact, what we're looking at is something like an attunement or an echo um, folded and unfolded before our eyes. So this conservator, Glenn Gates at the Strauss Center for Conservation, Harvard University, um, is trying to figure out how Morris Lewis painted. And that's what Lockhart wanted to photograph, the conservator trying to replicate Morris Lewis paintings. Um, I was astounded when I came and when I first really started to think about these images. I was going to end my talk with this story, but I don't have time to get to the story. Um, I went to high school with Glenn Gates, so I, I lost track of him and suddenly realized I was staring at these Lockhart photographs of one of my best friends from high school. So the stage photograph still has the power of the, of the painting, I want to say. You know that term of all parts. I'll skip this. Um, but to return to, for the moment, to Pine Flat. Consider the work as a related, um, as related to a kind of self-reflexive or solipsistic modernism. This hardly, at least from my reading, seems to be the case at all. What appears to embody a kind of belated modernism again amounts to a project steeped in new analogies, new connections, new correspondences. For Michael Fried, absorption signaled a mode in which painting was able to throw off its narrative functions and begin an ultimately monomaniacal focus on the self-reflexive logic of vision. Paradoxically, by negating the convention that a painting was meant to be beheld, absorptive subjects were thus solipsistic. They canceled out the presence of the spectator, turning them inward upon themselves. Later modernist conventions of suspending oppositions between figure and ground, foreground and background, achieved this eradication of painting's narrative basis in an even more radical way, severing the painting from the task of depicting the world, securing its lonely autonomy. If Lockhart's Pine Flat rhymes with this history of another medium, recalling the prehistory of modernist painting, it's in the spirit of canceling oppositions, I think, in a much more or a much different manner, oppositions that modernism needed to uphold. It's in the spirit, perhaps, of canceling modernism's melancholic withdrawal from the world altogether, because Lockhart's film is anything but autonomous, solipsistic, self-absorbed. It's not lonely, but a document of cohabitation, togetherness ultimately collaboration. Pine Flat's not absorptive, I want to say, but attuned. Not selfish, but generous. Perhaps linking its form to photography and to painting. Both. Not one or the other. Surely not medium specific. Attunement emerges then for me something like the antitype of abortion. Absorption. I said abortion. Absorption. We have to imagine that two fundamentally different dynamics for photography are being explored at the moment. Freed's model versus this one that I'm trying to imagine an artist like Jeff Wall versus Lockhart, absorption and theatricality, indeed art and objecthood, redux in a way. Fried does have something right in his account, his book on, in his recent book on photography, for example. I th just think he's on the wrong side of history once again. Lockhart surely does cancel all sense of figure ground distinctions in her filmic images. Grass spreads directly up the screen and merges through color matching with the trees and trunks of trees. Um, Horizon lines are rigorously suppressed in images like this one. Um, snow and fog join figures with their hazy fields. We're often too close to allow distinctions to emerge. And this closeness spreads to the children who fuse with their figureless fields in as much as we could say they, be, they become attuned to their environment. Like an untimely sibling of what Walter Benjamin once said about ruins, this vision of youth portrays its subjects as emerging their surrounds. Walter Benjamin said the ruin is a kind of merging into its surround. Lockhart achieves this in part through details of pose and costume. Blue jeans and a plaid shirt worn by the child in the episode from the film Bus, rhyming with the blue-green and resplendent California purple foliage, almost purple foliage, of the surrounding valley. 
or the position of the child's body in the episode Sleeper, curled up into the same shape as the crook between two rocks, curved into the same form as the land. In the episodes or pairs of groups, the children, even when bickering, seem to align themselves with each other. And as the children throw out so many ropes to their environs or their playmates, attuning and attaching themselves to their surrounds, we as viewers of Lockhart's film hardly find ourselves detached from the children before us, negated or separated by a scene of self-absorption. Instead, we find ourselves over that 10-minute expanse, over this temporal image, as opposed to the painterly image. Attuned, we find ourselves, rather, attuned to the children's absorption by Lockhart's filmic form. We're attuned to their attunement. As two children, for example, tread water in unison and look down, away from the camera, into the water's fluid depths, one of the most beautiful episodes, I think, in the film. You get a sense for it even in the still. We also, too, look down at them, positioned by the camera in such a way as to attune our gazing with theirs. And as the children wait or listen or play with no regard for the passing of time, we, too, find ourselves as viewers waiting. We find ourselves attuned to their attentiveness, joined in their temporal suspension. Our attunement to the children in Flockhart's film provokes a sense less of detachment, I want to say, than of care. It's thus been suggested in an essay on Pine Flat by Lockhart's friend, the artist Francis Stark, that Lockhart's close attention to children, her camera's open or capacious gaze in the Pine Flat project, should be compared in some sense or some analogy to that of the gaze of a mother toward a child, more essentialist metaphors, perhaps. But in her work's transformation of her camera eye that initially seems totalizing, perhaps oriented more towards surveillance or visual domination, into one of passive attentiveness and care, we do sense the opening up of something like a maternal, or at least a protective logic within the project. But attunement ultimately amounts to a quiet but unruly form of desire, I want to say. The normative familial metaphors, mother, father, Oedipal, even the redemptive forms of maternal care do not regulate, I think, all of its paths. Attunement, for example, is not the same thing as what psychoanalysis calls identification, not based on misrecognition, nor the rapacious drive to possess, to be or to have, as the Freudian narrative would put it. Attunement places two forms in the same key. It precisely does not equate them. Instead, this mutual rhyming preserves a crucial difference, distance, evinced in the distance tactics of Lockhart's oeuvre. Indeed, in Pine Flat, it's as if we gaze into the distance, not just of so many gorgeous natural vistas, but also into the intense mystery of the past. Ultimately, this is why the obsolete analog format of Lockhart's film, I think, seems so appropriate to my eyes. It signals an analogy not just with the threatened reality of rural youth in our present culture, like a pocket of historically surpassed experience subsisting against all odds. This seems weird to say where I am now, but I wrote it in LA. It points to the attunement that the film's images open up with Lockhart's own memories and memory images, and perhaps also with our own. So I'm concluding here, but try to follow this next couple of statements. It's gonna get, it's gonna be like in All About Eve, it's gonna be a bumpy ride, okay? The project embodies a literal nostalgia, a seeming resurrection or retrieval of youth, of childhood, of a time long past. It seems to fixate there, and the static camera that Lockhart utilizes amounts to just one sign of this, fixation. But we face a strange form of what we call nostalgic pining, like the title seems to refer us to. Or punning, I think, in the same manner as the title does. Pining denotes a melancholic wasting away from longing for home and for the past. In Pine Flat, however, this pining becomes a way to turn the wasting away into a gesture of generosity. Now it's the pining for the past in Pine Flat that displaces the hegemony of the author. It's a wasting away that makes space for the other. A giving up and giving over, such longing also hollows out the image of the past, we might say, exteriorizing it and depersonalizing it. We hardly know to whom these memories belong. It's actually why most critics, or we as an audience, hardly recognize them as memories. Thus exteriorized, they can be claimed by others in the presence. I'm asking you to imagine a memory that you don't own, a memory that someone else can claim as their own. And that's one thing this project tries to imagine. 
thus exteriorized, they can be claimed by others in the present. Simultaneously, this pining interiorizes. The wasting away from longing opens up a hole within the self, the emptiness or the loss often associated with melancholia, into which the other, the past of the other, the memories of another, can be inserted and where they can also be preserved. Imagine yourself remembering someone else's memories or something like that. And so here, to pine away from the past becomes an opening up to the world. It follows the ramifications of attunement, the impossible correspondence, the distance rhyming or the rhyming of distance, where now the other can be installed within the self and the self shared vertiginously with the other. This is the very heart or the very point of my reading of Lockhart's work. Pine flat, I want to say, amounts to what I guess we could call a displaced self-portrait. But it's also an other portrait, if I can invent that word with a dash. So self-portrait and other portrait. An imaging of the shared space, actually, between the self and the other. Thus, in our attunement to the children of Pine Flat, we don't identify with them, but we perhaps recognize ourselves in them. We're called upon to desire this self-exile. Following the work's disorienting logic, we almost see them as ourselves, but in the irretrievable past, and this becomes a motor for attachment in the present. We see and experience ourselves as them now. These two vertiginously similar experiences may appear equivalent. They're actually instead attunements, attempts to bring close two things that will never be the same. The episodes of Pine Flat emerge then as what we might call documents of memory and also fictions of reality. At the same time, they also rhyme with the opposite of such experience. As in Lockhart's work, oppositions always come undone. For Pine Flat also embodies a collection of fictional memories and realized, or maybe the better word is performed, documents. It testifies to an attempt literally to give shape to the past, to reshape the past, as well as to allow its now redeemed light to shine quietly upon the present. It's an attunement of the one to the other. This attunement of past and present joins all the other oppositions that structure Lockhart's work. The collaboration within our oeuvre of photography and film, document and fiction, memory and imagination, artist and subject, self and other, viewer and viewed. These oppositions are pairs, Lockhart shows us. And rather than hold themselves apart, these pairs call out to each other. Attunement here becomes the very modality of a kind of longing. It's the voyage home that will never reach its destination, a kind of approach, an intimate approach, that can never end. My talk continues, but I think I should end there, actually. So thank you very much. So I'd be happy to take any questions that may arise or any comments. Like, like I said at the beginning of the talk, and feel free if you need to leave to get up and stretch or whatever else. But I, it's a project that's still very much alive for me. Um, so any kind of comments are obviously going to be helpful. Um, there's a hand up way in the back. I can hear you.
active in this project, the empathetic um, form and empathy is something that has a history of being thought that I think could be useful to, to make this project go very deeper into the work. Um, I just came to attunement more because of the movement in the work away from the purely visual towards sound. And it's something a lot of the artists I'm working on in this book share. I mean, definitely in Tacita Dean's work everywhere, because they work with film, and the films carry soundtracks. Um, sound then infects the photographic work, it seems, for a variety of, in a variety of ways. Um, so echo, attunement, these kinds of words were the ones that I was stuck with even more than empathy. But the empathetic is absolutely part of what the drive or the dynamic of the forms that I'm trying to describe about what you said about painting, I want to just to put these more more recent works from the, from the Lunch Break project that I referenced but didn't get to in my talk up on the screen. I mean, it's obviously Baroque Caravaggio, paint, paintings by Caravaggio that she's thinking of in the, in the film that she just showed in, in L.A., very much Bruegel. Um, in the film Double Tide, if I have an image of it, it's going backwards. I have it upside down. Um, Caravaggio again. Yeah, there's a, there's a, what I would like to, I think maybe Jeff Wall uses this term actually, there's a kind of pictorial intelligence um, in the practice that is not about the kind of citational or appropriation work that we associate with postmodernism um, in earlier years, but um, is a is somehow about allowing forms to live on. And painting and photography have something to say to each other. I just don't think that this work, um, it would be very easy for some critics to talk about it in terms of Jeff Wall's work has been talked about, for example, as pastiche, as a way of reenacting or restaging history paintings. I don't think that's what the work does at all. It brings these references to various forms of history painting, Baroque painting, Caravaggio, et cetera, Manet, back into circulation for um, a very different project than reenactment or pastiche or the copy, all those sort of postmodern ideas. So that's something I haven't really thought through the painting connection enough yet. And I have to confront Michael Fried to do it, it seems. So that's where I'm stuck. Because you have to read his book on photography. Um, it's a hard one. Yes. Well, I'm dealing with artists who make films and artists who use photography, but they're really not positioned in the world of cinema. And I'm not a cinema historian. So, I mean, there are disciplinary boundaries that come back into play for me on this project. I am really interested in photography. I don't think you can think photography without cinema. So that's become a condition of my work coming out of a thinking of photography. The Michael Fried book, I just have a very simple, almost like a childlike retort to it which is that the difference between what he's doing and why photography matters as art as never before. I mean, the most incredible title ever given to a recent book in our history. And what I'm trying to do with the interpretation of the artists I'm engaged with here is that it's really about why photography matters as photography as never before that this project's about. And that's not a modernist statement. That's not a Michael Fried statement from the past of his modernist criticism because photography was never this kind of um, self-referencing medium. It was a diffuse medium or a medium that was self-differing and self-othering. And that, for me, this might go back to the empathy comment, like where, are, where, are this, where this essay is going, and the part of it that I wasn't able to share with you, is towards thinking of photography not just as a desiring modality, but as a kind of ethics or almost a form of life. 
that seems like, I mean, as I stand up here with these banners behind me, I thought like maybe I'm like Hitler, like a kind of Nazi rally is about to happen. But that idea of a kind of form or an aesthetic producing a life practice or a mode of ethics sounds potentially deeply aestheticizing, but also I think it could be a, a project to reclaim. And photography, Roland Barthes writing on photography, Walter Benjamin's writing on photography, the canonical essays on photography carry in them a kind of set of values that aren't just about the medium. They're values in terms of what one does with history. How do you deal with memories in the past? Um, what does it mean to love? Really is a great photographic question. Um, or to touch, uh, to have contact with something. And even in the moment of stage photography, which is why this project might be building to that moment where I realized one of my best friends from high school is in the stage photograph that's supposed to have no indexical power anymore and suddenly I'm seeing you know something from my own personal past it's just it's just a coincidence it's just chance but there is still something conceptually about that power living on in the project and that's what I'm after yes I think if I follow what you're saying, I think it's a confusing moment, and I have maybe to think about the terms of it. Um, but like the paradox I was trying to point to is that in in this project, what no one seemed to realize, what becomes I think visible when you see how the pine flat portraits and the film episodes seem to relate directly to these rephotographed family snapshots of Lockhart's own childhood, that what seems to be a documentary project about this specific place, this specific group of children, is actually, at least allegorically, a self-portrait, too. Um, but if it's a self-portrait, then it's not about the singular self anymore. I mean, what would another portrait be? Is that documentary photography? Is that ethnographic representation? No, that's not what I'm trying to get at. What I'm trying to get at is a portrait, meaning a picturing of the self, that realizes the self is always not identical with itself. The self is always somehow open to the other. Um, and I think that this project tries to imagine in a formal way, tries to create a form where that imagination becomes possible. So are we done? Thank you very much.